in our lives. The cough is a vast improvement these days. Really quite nice. <laughs> yeah. We'll go through the safety features later, so you know where the fire exit is and the toilet facilities. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. That would be greatly appreciated. You wouldn't let me know where they are, would you, first, so I can then expand it up where they are, because I haven't got a clue, really. <laughs> I know where mine are. I did test my fire alarms yesterday, so that's good. It's 10 o'clock, I think we ought to start. Um, just want to read some... Um, and I would like to begin by welcoming, welcoming those members of the public and press who are watching the live stream of this meeting via the Council's website. Due to the government guidance on social distancing, this meeting is held remotely in accordance with the provisions out in the local authorities and police and crime panels, coronavirus, flexibility of local authority and police and crime panel meetings, England and Wales regulations 2020. Yes, I think that it would want to come up with such a long title, wouldn't it? And they're also being uh, held uh, with the Cambridge County Council's own virtual meeting protocol. Minutes of the meeting will be produced in the usual way and recording of the meeting will be on the meeting page of the council website. To enable, <coughs> excuse me, to enable meeting to leave, I would ask all members of the board who have video cameras to keep their video camera switched on for the duration of the meeting and to keep their microphone mute except when I invite them to speak. Officers will join us to introduce the thoughts in the usual way. Any members wishing to ask questions or make a comment should indicate this by hand function on the right hand side of their screen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, when I invite you to speak at your microphone, ask your question, and then mute it again to allow the officer to respond. I would ask for your patience if we run out problems. <coughs> and should this occur, I will declare an adjournment while the fault is addressed and the public broadcast will pause. <coughs> if it is not addressed the fault, the meeting may be abandoned until such time be reconvened. <coughs> I have a little, um, I've got a few. So I'm just going to pause and uh, start sucking a sweet so I don't keep on coughing. Sorry about that. <coughs> um, pension board members in the meeting with a roll call to establish who is present. When I call, please confirm by unmuting your microphone and stating that you are present. David Brooks. Present. John Stokes. Present. Barry Present. Present. Councillor Elisa Machini. Present. Councillor Dennis Payne. Present. And myself, Councillor Simon King. Just want to check before we move on uh, two things. First of all, uh, Councillor Machini said that she needs to leave at 11.45. So I hope I can conclude the meeting by then. Um, I'm, I, don't, I certainly don't want to rush anything, but I think it would be a matter of courtesy to try and finish by then so that uh, she can stay for the duration of the meeting. Is everybody happy with that? Thank you. Great. And, second, yes, and the great. second thing is, is everybody with the raise hand function? 
I won't see anybody is unhappy, please hand. But uh, sorry. Um, if anybody is sorry, I don't. I don't. Sorry, I don't seem to have a raise hand function. Okay. Um, can anybody help Barry with that? If you go to the participants section, Barry. Oh right. Okay. You click on that. It will show you all the participants on the right hand side. Yeah. Now I found it. Now. Yeah. Got it. Well done. And everybody else is okay with that. Okay, thank you all very much. And I will now pass you over to Rob Sanderson for the first time. Over to you, Rob. Good morning. As this is the first meeting of the new municipal year, the first item on the agenda is to invite the board to appoint a chairman and vice chairman. As highlighted in previous years, there is no requirement in the regulations to prevent you reappointing the current chairman. But if that is the case and Councillor King is reappointed, the subsequent vice chairman appointment must be drawn from the board scheme members, representatives. Can I therefore now invite nominations for chairman? You'd show with a hand if you want to. David Brooks. Yes, I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor King as chair. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? John Stokes? Speak. Yeah, I will second that. No other nominations? Barry Sullivan, got you, O'Sullivan, to speak? Uh, it was just a second. Okay. Same. So in that case, I'd um, like to invite uh, Councillor King to take over the chairman. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you, fellow board members. Um, as I said before, um, it's a great honour to be the chairman of the pension board, in my opinion, and I will do my best um, to fulfil that uh, responsibility. So thank you very much. Um, can I have nominations for the vice chairman, please? So can I, can I just say, Chair, that um, since it's my intention to uh, retire at the end of this year, I would rather not be nominated. You would rather not be nominated, did you say, David? Yes, that's correct, uh, Chair, because I, I, it's my intention to, to retire at the end of this year. Very well, if, if that is your wish, David, because I, I was... I was going to nominate you, but uh, that's fine. So, uh, um, so can I have any other nominations, please? I mean, I must confess I would rather not do it, but I'd like to nominate Barry if he would be interested. Maybe. Okay, I accept that. And I would be very happy to second you, Barry, as well. So thank you for doing that. Okay, thank you. No problem. And Barry, uh, Rob, I'm asking you this question. Barry is eligible, is he? Yes, he is. Yes. He is. Jolly good. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for that. So moving on to our next agenda item, which is <clears throat> apologies for absence. I don't believe we have any, do we, Rob? No, we've got full board membership here today. Um, thank you very much again, Rob. And uh, the next is disclosure of interest. Does any member uh, wish to declare any uh, dis disclosable pecuniary interest or non-statutory disclosable? I'm taking that as a no. Um, so thank you for that. And if we reach uh, an agenda item that you suddenly realize you should have declared an interest on, you can always do it then. So uh, this is not a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Agenda item three is the uh, minutes of the previous pension board meeting. And uh, I shall now go through the minutes page by page. And please raise uh, your hand if you wish to, to make a point. So, page one.
page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. <clears throat> Page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page ten. Page 11. Can I have a question on page 10, please, Sonny? Certainly. Yes, David. Um, the uh, fourth paragraph down, I did say I would not be attending any external events. Yes. I remember you saying that, David. Yes. So uh, can we make that amendment, Rob, please? Rob? Hello? Sorry, I thought I'd unmuted my microphone. Uh, that's to say that David Brooks does not want to be invited to any external events, was that? Yes, and that was uh, page 10 of the minutes. And what, the, what number is that, David, on the, uh, on the agenda pack? the page number. Page, page 10. Got that. Thank you. Page 10. OK. Right. So seven then. Page 12. And finally, page 13. So is everybody happy <coughs> uh, that we agree the minutes as a crowd? And uh, I'll sign a hard copy when we eventually return to Shire Hall, possibly sometime in uh, 2021 at this rate. Any, dis any, any dissenters for approving the minutes? Okay. Right. Moving on to the next agenda item, uh, which is the updated action log. And uh, Joe, Michelle, do you have any uh, further updates to add since the uh, distribution? Uh, no, I've got nothing to update on that. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you, Joe. Any questions? No. Okay. So. Uh, Sorry, Chair. Um, there are some raised hands. I don't know if. I'm what... not getting. I'm not getting any. Have they you can't... got your list of participants open, Chair? You need to keep I it open. I'm uh, pain has asked to speak. I, I'm. I'm sorry. That was my. That was my fault. Um, uh, Councillor Payne. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Can I just say as to item <clears throat> uh, 136, um, I am now available on the event in July. So I will Thanks. be able to attend the virtual event. Thank you. We'll make sure you're on the um, list of people to be sent the Zoom login details. Thank you. And I also have uh, uh, Counts uh, uh, David Brooks. The second chair <clears throat> on page twenty-four um, under minute one four two, which is a discussion we had about problems for people finding their way around the the uh, website. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that may be a little confusing because it actually discussed under under uh, minute one three seven. 
Okay. So what what change would you like to see in that, David? I, I'd just like to see a sort of minute 142 to have 137 and 142 there. Right. Can we amend that, Rob? Uh, yes, no problem. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, I'm just checking to see if there are any other raised hands. Nope. Um, thank you very much, David. Um, I've just got a couple of quick things on here. The first one is um, the... Uh, uh, sorry, I'm just looking for the number here. It was, it really is the review of the board size. And um, I think that uh, this is becoming a fairly urgent item because we we really do need to look at recruiting some additional board members so just to uh, um, to flag up that it's not just about the board's side it's also about recruiting new board members and uh, I think we should add that either as a subset of that action or, or action uh, with this continuing coronavirus business, it's going to make recruitment, if anything, more difficult, I would have thought. So, uh, so is there something we can add on that one, Rob, as well? Uh, uh, yes, we can. I mean, I can say that we, we will be having an advertisement. Um, uh, pensions service will be sending out something to all scheme members to okay. uh, apply. Um, and I believe that's going out in August. Uh, so we right. are, you know, actively now looking to recruit new board members because clearly uh, Barry O'Sullivan and David Brooks have indicated that they will be stepping down in, I believe, 2021. OK. Thank you very much for that, Rob. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Everybody happy for that to be added? Right, moving on to the next agenda item, which is... Uh... Sorry, Chair. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, Chair. Well, I raised my hand. Um, yes, can you we did. Have... Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I, I, the first thing, just to correct Rob, I, I wasn't planning on stepping down. Oh, apologies, I thought you'd uh, made it clear that... You... Oh, it could be that you didn't want to go to the end of the term of office. I mean, if I've got that wrong, that's fine, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the other thing, can we make the recruitment uh, a standing item on the agenda so we can be kept updated? I think, Barry, that's an excellent suggestion. Uh, I'm really glad you're willing to continue. So could, could we have that as a standing agenda item, uh, Rob? Yeah, no problem at all. Hmm. I mean, I'm hoping that we will get some uh, applications during this. Well, when I say the summer, obviously it is the summer. Hopefully uh, later in August, September, because uh, what I'd like to do is, um, if necessary, if we get, we've got to interview people and, uh, you know, that's presuming people come forward, of course. Um, and then what we'd like to do is perhaps uh, have them just uh, sitting in on a meeting to see, you know, whether it's something they'd really like to do. And also yes. get experience. <coughs> existing members they could uh, interview them you know and... <coughs> i think that's an excellent idea rob and uh, um and i'm really pleased Barry, again that you're going to be continuing so um with that i'm just checking participants john you have your hand up uh yeah thanks on um we were looking at a review of the conditions of the Posts weren't we, or something or other? It wasn't going to be a review. Um, if that's, that's if we're going to have a major advertising thing, would it be best to get sorted out first? I thought that that was the terms of reference that were being looked at, um, 
and yes, uh, it's been paused according to the action log because of uh, coronavirus. Is that correct, Joe, Michelle? Um, yeah, what I would say is that that is probably a slower process than recruitment. So I think they should run in tandem rather than one first, then the other. So, yeah, we'll get it back on the agenda as soon as we can, which is okay. looking at like, very soon now that things have calmed down a bit. Yeah, it's just that I think if you're going to um, advertise and interview people, I think it's important that they have a current up-to-date terms of reference so they know what they're taking on. Yes. It's not, I think that's a that's a good comment, John. And uh, <clears throat> I think, though, we must accept that coronavirus has thrown a number of these things adrift. And uh, I think the recruitment is a really pressing issue because, uh, you know, we can't continue really with two board members short or however many it is. Yeah. But uh, we will keep that, we will keep an eye on that. It's on the action log uh, and the recruitment is going to be a standing item. Um, perhaps we ought to, in view of what's been said though, make it recruitment and terms of reference as that standing item. How would people feel about that? Yeah, I agree. That's great. Thank you. David, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, Chair. I mean, I, I, I don't want to um, walk away at the end of this year and leave anybody in the lurch. So, I mean, I am willing to sort of let it run a bit longer if necessary so that you don't end up with a member short. But obviously, the sooner we can get somebody replacement, the better. David, that's a very kind offer and much appreciated. And uh, Rob, you'll make a note of that, but uh, we mustn't take advantage of David's uh, good nature if we don't have to. No, I, so, I, thank I, you I all appreciate very that as well, um, because, you know, it, this will take a while because there have been, we have had to delay the process because uh, pension service have had other priorities. So um, we've not moved as quickly as we would have liked. I, I, I think, you know, we are in exceptional time. And I think, um, you know, David's flexibility reflects that. And it's, it's very good of you, David. Thank you. So um, shall we move on to the next agenda item, if everybody is happy with the action log? I don't see any more. Oh, Dennis, you have your hand up. Sorry. Council Payne. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I was just going to say that um, if we find it very difficult to... Uh, find a member representative. Um, I, of course, am a scheme member. Um, and if we might be able to find another employer representative, we could perhaps arrange a switch over. But let's see how the process uh, runs. That's the helpful suggestion, uh, De Dennis. Thank you. And Rob, if you could make a note of that. Perhaps. So if we are in an extreme position, we could uh, um, pursue the course of action Dennis suggested. So, yeah. So I'm not uh, seeing any other hands up. So uh, we'll move on from the action log, shall we, to uh, the minutes of the pension committee <coughs> of the 18th of June. And uh, these are presented to the board for information. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. If any members have questions on the pension committee minutes, could you just raise your hands in the usual way? Okay. I'm not seeing any hands raised. So we'll move on then, I think, to the next agenda item, which is... Um, general the internal audit uh, report um, and I think Stephen Mangan is presenting that aren't you Stephen? Yes thank you chair. Um, thank you. Just Hi, before, Stephen. 
Hi, nice to meet you. Um, just to provide context, this item was considered in full at the June Pension Committee as well. Um, the report summarises the finding from the Internal Audit Review of Arrangements covering the administration of pensions for the financial year 2020-21. Um, as part of each audit we uh, undertake, we give a level of assurance or two levels of assurance. In terms of the adequacy of the system, we are pleased to report that we provided the highest level of assurance available, substantial, which reflects our view that effective and embedded systems are in place to support the administration of pensions. Um, just to provide some context with that, we've actually identified no weaknesses in the design of the systems in place. In terms of compliance, um, good assurance was provided in that overall we found high levels of compliance with agreed processes. Um, as you can imagine, in every audit that we undertake, we find some issues. Um, and in advance of attending the pension committee, I followed up the three actions which are included in the report. Um, I'm pleased to report that two of the actions have been fully implemented already. And the one item will lead to unreconciled items in relation to control accounts. Um, I'm comfortable now that prompt action is being taken within the pensions team to resolve those items um, and that they are a clear liaison now with payroll to resolve the other remaining issues. In terms of formally following up those actions, we'll do that when we undertake the 2021 review. Um, we haven't actually confirmed a date at the moment for the obvious reasons, as, as we've talked about already, but we're likely to start that in November, December time. Um, I don't really intend to go into any more detail than that because actually it's a positive point other than to point out that um, the report um, does look at a couple of specific reconciliations such as employer and employee contributions and the pensions payroll to Altair. Um, our review considers whether there is a process in place to complete this work and that this is being progressed. Given the scale of such reviews and other work priorities, we as auditors are not really in a position to judge how quickly should such activities should be completed other than notice the status of this work. Um, at that point, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Stephen. <clears throat> I was very impressed with this. Are there any questions, uh, members? David. The Secretary Chair, I, I have two actually. <clears throat> First of all, does this refer to a specific year? Um, yes, sorry, this covers the 2019-20 period, so the period up to the end of March. I apologise if I said it, might have said it was 2020-21, but it's the period up to March 2020. It's just I expect to see that on the beginning of the front of the report. But anyway, passing on, on page 33, this is the 2019-20. A bit surprised to see that the record is only 5.2. We're still reconciling the 17-18. Um, yes, um, Councillor. Um, the, the issue with this, as I think I've just highlighted, is that this is this such reconciliations are quite significant pieces of work, um, and so. In our point of view, what we're looking to see is that there's been substantial progress on it. In, 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 in that case, the reconciliation is nearly completed. There's just a, at the time when the audit was completed, um, and there's just a small number of issues um, just needed to be resolved. Um, I think it goes back to our point that we're not really in a position to judge how quickly these should be completed. We well, know, of course, we would recommend that they're completed on a timely basis so that any issues can be resolved. Okay, fine, thank you. And on page 36, it's a statement that's made in the, in the end of the first paragraph on page 36 uh, about saying that uh, dealing with some older, trans older, older transactions are time consuming. Uh, yes, of course they are. So <laughs> it's an obvious statement, but what's been done to speed that up? Because all the time, a lot of time is being taken with older transactions, the newer transactions are becoming older. Sorry, um, Councillor, I'm not really positioned to answer that specific query. I don't know whether officers present might be able to answer that or we can get a, a short note to you after the committee. I was under the impression that it's now been cleared. Oh, thank, thank you, Joe. All of that work. But I will find out for you for sure. It's, um, 
It's not my area, but I'll, I'll find out and let you know and feedback to the board if that's okay. But I think it's completed. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Councillor Payne. Uh, Chairman, thank you. I'm, I think I'm asking the same question, which is the, uh, what is it, nearly 400, 430 items that are unreconciled and prior to April 2019 as to whether it will actually even be physically possible to um, uh, reconcile them. Um, but I think Joe is saying that is being may actually even have been done and I'd welcome confirmation. Yeah, if we, are we, which item are you talking about specifically, Dennis? Page 38, item three, the control account. Yeah, um, well, a lot of work has been undertaken on this area. So as I believe on the um, net pay account, I think that's work in progress. Still, but the suspense account has, I believe, has been fully reconciled. But I'll get an update on those two areas for you. And um, the target dates were March, March for um, suspense account, and March 21 for the net pay. That one's a bit more involved, just due to the nature of return term payments and clearing those out. That's where some people may have passed away, some members may have passed away, and we need to um, process their their last payment, either as a balance of pension or, or whatever's required, or pay it to the estate. So it's a complicated area a bit more admin work involved. Thank you. I was basically just concerned as to whether it was going to be possible to do. If um, it's going to take a while, so be it. Yeah, it, it's one of those uh, areas of work that is quite time consuming due to the nature of um, having to deal with that scheme members and their families. So it does take a lot longer than just moving money from one sort of CL code to another. So. And, and can I just add at this point that it, it, it should be possible to rec to resolve the issues. I mean, it, it, whilst I understand this, there's a there's a long period that's elapsed. It's still a relatively short period in the scheme of things of of, of records. So there is no real reason why we don't believe this can't be resolved. Thank you very much, Stephen. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not seeing any more raised hands. So um, this is uh, this is encouraging news things seem to be going very well and uh if everybody's happy with that um shall we move on to the next agenda and this is the administration performance report and uh joe <coughs> would you like to present this please <coughs> yes thank you um so this report this time has a few more months um captured within it because obviously we didn't have the april meeting um, so if I run through it in order, um, so on page 41, we have the usual reference to the variances against the forecast of investments administration expenses. Uh, detail of that is in appendix one, which is on page 47 to 48. Um, and then the second section of the report is on key performance indicators for LGSS pensions on appendix two, page 49. And I thought I would address this in a bit of detail in that um, we have a new KPI in there, um, which is the um, payment of pen pension benefits from deferred membership status. Uh, we thought it best to include this going forward due to the fact that it is a quite a voluminous area for us and requires a lot of resources. Um, and it can also it can impact the work we do on the, the one above, which is payment of retirement benefits from active employment. They're, they are um, sort of one of the same, but a very demanding piece of work for our service. Um, other than that, I could, Looking at, um, if we're thinking about the impact of COVID and the effect of that really being felt in April and May, that you'll see that all our targets were actually met during those months, except for two down here on the transfer in quote to members. Um, so I think that really does demonstrate the performance during a, a very difficult time where we've had to adapt to working from home and embedding different technology to be able to enable us to work. Um, so I, I hope you find that to be positive news. So going back to page four, um, sorry, page 41, receipt of employee and employer contributions, appendix three, um, sorry, I'm just looking through my papers, shows um, how we, the timeliness of receipt of the contributions and the schedules that go with that. 
as you can see, again, in the periods that would be affected by COVID, which is March and April, because the contributions paid arrears in a month in arrears, you can see performance there is really good from our scheme employers. Um, very few late returns. In fact, 100% of schedules received on time for the month of March, which is actually in effect April. So this is really good news. Um, that employers have been able to keep going with their processes as well. Um, and then going back to the report, page 42, um, section five, uh, we have the breaches of the law. This is a, a new item that we've, we've started to bring to you for your attention. So here we have um, items of administration that haven't gone in accordance with the law, um, which we need to report on our internal breach logs and to you as the local pension board. Uh, pension committee also get to see this information. So the nature of the breaches here, we have deemed to be of non-material nature, as in not of significance to report to the pensions regulator. Um, I, at this stage, I should make you aware that you as individual members of the local pension board um, are able to, if you feel that they are material breaches, you, are feel, you can feel free to report those to the pensions regulator should you wish to do so. We all have individual roles in that, so um, you feel free to take a different view if that's what you feel. Um, so the nature of the breaches here, some of them have been within our control, some of them haven't. Um, so just going through them, one that isn't in our control is the second one down, which is the stage two in, internal dispute resolution procedure responses weren't issued by the monitoring officer of Cambridgeshire County Council within the two month period. Um, that one wasn't within our control. We have an interesting area, which is the third one down, 16 refund of pension contribution payments were claimed by and paid to members outside the statutory five year period. This five year statutory five year period only came into the scheme um, from 2014. Um, it's not proving very helpful to the administration of the scheme and it's looking as though regulations will be amended to remove that requirement because that again is dependent upon members physically claiming a refund. Sometimes they don't know they've got one to be paid. Sometimes they're so small that members can't be, um, don't have the energy to claim it. So it's unfair that the scheme should be penalized because of that. Um, there was 803 entitlement letters that were issued outside of the two month period that we have to um, issue those. Um, again, that was because our internal procedures um, weren't up to date and we, we had a period of time where we weren't sending them out as a matter of course. That has now been addressed and that's happening. Um, 1,792 welcome letters were not issued to new members joining the scheme within the two months point of us knowing that they joined the scheme. Um, this was due to a backlog of new starters we've received from employers and um, it just wasn't possible to cope with that at the time. So again, we've deemed all those as non-material. Um, there's been no necessary impact on members' benefits at all, so we haven't felt them worthy of reporting to the pensions regulator. Um, should I pause there and take any questions before I carry on with the report? Thank you, Joe. I think that's a good idea. <clears throat> I should just say as well, that if any members want to ask questions um, on um, four, I think Rob, I'm right in saying we have to go into private session, don't we? Yes. I think Rob's still on mute, but yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, that, that would be the case, but I mean, uh, you could talk in general terms, but just don't mention individual employers is what I would okay there's a better way so in general terms uh, but not mentioning individual names is that right Rob yes or yes. amounts or amounts so um any questions at this stage for Joe I've got to count the pain and Barry so uh Dennis would you like to go first uh, thank you chairman um Joe um the numbers all suggest that the team is coping. Um, is that actually the case? Is everybody well, happy and everything else? Um, yes, everybody is well. We, um, uh, Northamptonshire County Council require us to report on that to, to the council um, end of every week. 
And so we've got no significant issues with the virus. Um, there was a few people at the beginning of April that probably had symptoms of the virus, um, but that was in the days before testing. So there was never any concrete confirmation of that. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there's been no reports of any symptoms at all that could be virus related um, for about two or three months now. So that's very positive news. Um, Work-wise, I'm covering this in a later report, perhaps in a bit more detail, but I'll say it now. Um, everyone's got the technology they need to work from home. Um, so everything has worked quite well, really. The only issue we do have is with postage, um, posting things and printing, because we can't do that from home. We've got one person in the office that deals with the incoming post. Um, so we've had to find creative ways of getting information to members um, using member self-service. So that's probably the only impact. And in terms of March and April, um, were there um, excess deaths over and above what you would normally have expected? Um, we are also reporting on that to, um, to the technical group of the, um, of the pension funds that um, it's hard to say. Um, at this stage, we don't really think so. Obviously, there would have been a few more extras, um, but we're not, we've not been overwhelmed with the number, put it that way. And we don't always get to see um, causes of death, uh, because if the people notify us through Tell Us Once, um, all we get is a date, we don't get any causes. So it's pretty hard to sort of know which are non-virus related deaths and which ones aren't. Okay, I mean, I was at uh, Pension Board um, event uh, last week, and people were, whilst the absolute numbers may have been small, um, suggesting that they other uh, schemes had actually had significant increase in um, excess deaths. Um, I have a general question on par on Appendix Four, which is. If this had run on, would we have seen some of the same employers um, there who appear repeatedly? And is appropriate action being taken regarding those? Are we talking about the two in March and April about naming names? Yes. Um, yes, um, Michelle, I don't know if you know anything about these two employers, do you? Sorry. Okay, no. don't, um, don't worry about it. Um, normally the team do um, come back to us and flag if there's any real cause for concern. Obviously, um, for those two months, they are kind of on our list now to keep an eye on because obviously another one will trigger some action. So we'll see what happens for May. Um, and obviously, if it is another trigger there, then we'll action that accordingly. Is that right, uh, Dennis? Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, I now have uh, Barry and then David. Barry. Um, it was just the uh, section five about the breaches of law. I just wondered, it's not claiming that uh, material breaches but just to query if members don't get welcome letters can that not have an effect on because isn't there a time limit on transfers in so if a member's not really aware of that uh, that could be an impact yes um yes um yeah i don't know if we have had any complaints as a result of that. Um, but most members who do join the scheme are sometimes more aware about the ability to transfer in as well. So they do come to us voluntarily and don't wait for us to ask them if they have any transfers in. Um, also, I'd, I'd need to think about what Im information that the employer gives regarding the pension scheme as well. So whilst our letters um, are, are signposting and welcoming them and asking them to join member self-service, I think the, employer, the information that comes direct from the employer may have information as well. Okay. Of course, we do also have a problem with employers being very late in telling us people have joined. Sometimes we only find out at year end. So we can exercise the discretion if people have transfers in um, to allow them extra time <coughs> to complete, complete that process if they want to. So, yeah, it really is dependent on the, on the employer giving us information at the right time. 
Um, well, whilst I, I'm speaking to you, Joe, uh, also my other question is is related to how is everybody, but presumably are there actual benefits to staff from working from home? Do you like productivity? Um, I think that depends on who you ask. <laughs> some people <laughs> like working from home, some people don't. Um, yeah, well, we have seen productivity has been unaffected, um, but then we do wonder whether, but you also need to think about whether we're getting as much in. People might not be thinking about retiring at this stage. We're not getting the amount of retirement estimates that we normally would. Um, but the productivity from what we have received and need to action has, has, has been fine. So, um, yeah, I think it's working well. Whether this will continue into the future or not, it, like um, you're probably aware that Cambridge here aren't allowing people in the office at all. We aren't technically supposed to be going in for more than printing. So don't know what the future holds in terms of home working. Um, there are lots of changes to be had at Northampton County Council what with unitary as well. So, yeah, we're just taking it month by month and seeing how it's going. Well, I do know at Cambridge they're, they're making early preparations, but I just know they physically can't have everybody in. Yeah. Because they can't maintain the social distancing. So. No, and I think that's the case at um, One Angel Square as well. There are quite a few people in delivering key worker services, so and they're already socially distant and spread out in the building, so capacity will be significantly reduced if we're still on a two metre or one metre social distancing basis going forward. Thank you, Joe. Uh, <clears throat> and I've got uh, um, David. Yes, thank you, Chair. I have, a, I have a couple of questions on page 48, if I may. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I hadn't got that far yet. Do you want me so, to... Um... Do you want to go on or I'll come back to it then? Um, yeah, do you want me to, I can quickly finish off the report. There isn't much more to go. So. Um... That's fine. I think that's a good <laughs> idea, Joe. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, where I left off, so we're now on section six, the internal dispute resolution procedure. Um, this is where the formal process uh, for dealing with complaints that can't be resolved at an informal level. Um, it's been quite quiet, as you can see. There's only been three pieces of activity during the period from January to May. Um, so, and you can see from the dates here, the first one has gone to the pensions ombudsman, having not been upheld at stage one and stage two, and we haven't heard from the pensions ombudsman since January. Um, we had one complaint about entitlement to a frozen refund, which wasn't upheld, and we've heard no, no further from that on that member. And what we are seeing a groundswell of is people who have transferred out in the past to a, another pension scheme, not necessarily an occupational scheme, are now coming back to us and saying that they were missold this, or we didn't take enough, um, give them enough information. Um, prevent them from transferring out. And claims companies are getting heavily involved and taking um, quite large percentage chunks from any reinstatement. Like we've seen quotes of 18% uh, they want to charge members for successfully getting their pension reinstated. So this is a bit of a growing area of concern for us and the industry as a whole. So, I mean, we've requested further information from the member on that case with regards to sort of dealing with this and we haven't heard anything back since March but I suspect we will because we did ask some very technical in-depth questions um, so it's an area that as a board and certainly as a governance manager I'm really keeping an eye on um, I feel like it's going to grow as the industry for the selling and claims grows. Um, moving on to the data improvement plan um, I have an update here on the resolution of unprocessed lever records um, you'll see the figures there on page 43. Moving forward to contract without liabilities rectification. This project we've been talking about for years and we are finally almost reaching a point now um, where I've got an update to this report where HMRC were delaying the issuance of the final file of data that would allow us to move on to the rectification stage. Um, they were due to issue these files by the 31st of July, and it looks like that date is going to be met because we have started to receive some data now. So hoping that we can move that project on um, in the autumn of 2020. So that will be good. And then the rest of the report is the employers' emissions and cessations information. Um, 
Other than that, um, I think that's really it from me and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for that, Joe. Um, David, you had that question. Yes, thank you, Chair. I have, I have two questions on page 48. One is over the scope of government, governance expenses. I mean, Ernst Young have increased their cost by 200% and it's been accepted. I'm amazed. Have we not retained it for this? Or? Um, I had heard they'd increase their costs, but I think that might be some element of discussion on that. Paul, sorry to call you in. Do you know anything about this? I do. I, Sorry, so yeah, no. the question again. I was too busy trying to get back in. <laughs> so David was, was a, sorry. It, it was. It was. Sorry, I was just going to say it was a question on page forty-eight, Paul, of total governance expenses, the two hundred percent increase. Uh, in governance expenses. Uh, um, yeah. What would page forty-eight. So I don't actually have the, I have the individual reports. So can you just find help me find the the number the, the, the report? Which report are we on? I, I was um, okay. trying to... administration performance report. Yeah. I can say that when I finish this, because when this obviously information came through, as like you, I said, or two hundred percent increase. The only thing I do know about this area is that apparently EY are reviewing all of their processes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So apparently what they've done, they've done a lot of work to look at actually the true costs and the audits. Um, and I believe, Paul, that something's come through as part of that review and that's where the increase has come from. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some acknowledgement from external audit that the, the fees that are normally paid do not meet the, 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 the resources really required. Um, and with, with the result of COVID, there's certainly been um, a lot of surveys across the LGPS community regarding uh, increased costs coming through from audit. So there is a review going on, is as much as we can say. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying, Paul, but surely in audit they tend to for a fixed period of time, don't they? They do. I, I can't really add more than I've said, David, I'm, uh, in the sense that um, there's been a lot of, shall we say, communication between funds as to the, um, the general direction of travel that's coming through on this one and it's still being discussed and reviewed. Uh, I have to say, I, I, I wish to um, say that I think this is pretty appalling because if somebody's tended for a job for a fixed period of time and they're tended at a cost, then they can't just increase their rates by 200%. Irrespective of what happens to other LGSS or other LGSS schemes, that is just not acceptable. It's I, because I of it's it's because of extraordinary circumstances, David. They they are allowed to to charge extra in certain circumstances. Now, as I say, all I can say is um, this is currently being discussed and reviewed. Can I just come in there? Um, we don't. They don't tender for services. The government allocate them on a fixed fee basis. So there's no element of there's no procurement involved as such. So right. we don't really have a lot of control over that. Okay. Thanks, Matt. And on my last question on page 49, on the um, third section of payment of benefits, the January figure doesn't add up. Oh, which that, line was that, David? Sorry, on the third, the appendix two, page 49, the third yep. item, the January figure says 42 completed, 31 within target, three over target. Okay. So if it's only three and if it's only three were over target, you're actually hitting ninety five percent. Against the raw data, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, David. And John, you have your hand up. A very naive question, I'm sure. On page forty nine, under the target. Um, why isn't it a hundred percent? Wouldn't that be what you were aiming for? And if there is a reason for having a lower number, how do you arrive at a lower number than a hundred percent? As the target, 
realistically, um, we would have to have a lot of resource to have a hundred percent, complete hundred percent all the time. Then that wouldn't probably be practical in in the real world. So I wouldn't, if we had a hundred percent targets, I don't think any fund has a hundred percent targets. It's just not the way it works. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's a very good reason. It just seems a bit odd to me if I'm trying to achieve something, regardless, the target's still 100%. Um, it's yeah, well, the aspiration is 100%, obviously. Um, but in practical terms, um, it's set a bit lower so that you know, there is scope for movement in terms of you know, fluctuations in other areas. So it, it's been like that for a long time, the targets. And we've, we've even sometimes thought about lowering them. Well, that's so, what my next question was. Well, how do you arrive at the lower figure? Um, right, this is probably where I need my operations manager to come in, who isn't on the call. So um, yeah. I'll go away and ask those questions for you, if that's okay. I'm just curious. It's not serious, Joe, but I, I just feel that the whole one should look for 100%. But I do appreciate what you say. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I I think, John, you know, in, in a number of different areas that I'm involved in, um, <clears throat> you know, while there is a 100% figure, the target is not necessarily the same as the figure. And the, the target needs to be realistic and achievable. The 100% is really that. So I think that's the logic behind the number. Um, I don't know if that helps. I'll, I'll concur to your better judgment, Simon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know if it's better judgment. It probably comes under the heading of bitter experience. Um, just going back to uh, to David's point about the 200% the increase, I, I, I think it... Um, I, I share his terms on that, and I wonder if the board would be would support us sending uh, a message to Paul uh, to do whatever he can to um, revisit that two hundred percent increase, because I do think that is rather excessive. Yeah, um, if I may, um, it's not technically. But uh, Paul's area anymore. It is Ben who is also not on the call. Um, but oh, I, oh, oh, yeah. No, that, that's, that's all right. Um, I was just, yeah. I mean, I think we are concerned, but it's something that I think EY have been delivering services um, for years at a lower fixed price, and I'm not defending them in any way. But the reality is that auditing pension schemes is now a lot more complex than it used to be, and perhaps they do. You know, somebody like, needs to review what the actual cost is. That's giving me a giving okay. the balanced answer. Um, but yeah, no, we'll take your concerns. Um, I'm not actually sure if I'm allowed to say or if I know how much the audit is, but I'm, I'm sure it's, it probably is, does need a bit of a looking at just to make sure it is you know, the right price. I think yes. that's, that's why I said, Joe, it's, it's under review because it is a, at this point, it's a sensitive area. Um, and all we can say is that uh, we are looking at it, we are understanding some of the issues, um, but we can't give a conclusion at this stage. It, it's too early in the, in, the, in the process. No, that's fair enough, Paul, but uh, are, are all the board happy if uh, we pass on our concerns to, uh, to Jo and, and her colleagues? No good dissent? So, um, that might help you in your discussion. Thank so, you. Shall, on to the next, shall we go on to the next agenda item, which uh, we're being asked to uh, to note that report. And the next agenda item is agenda item eight. And this is also Joe doing the introduction. Thank you, Joe, to you. Thank you very much. Um, again, this is our regular governance compliance report um, that we bring to you. It's it's very, very long this time, largely because we missed the months of April, um, the reporting months of April because the meeting was cancelled, um, but also because there's quite a bit going on. Um, what we have here is, um, now I don't know how you want to deal with this because I could 
go through this and it could take quite a bit of time. Or I could ask if anybody has any questions they have on any specific items that I can answer. Um, I think that given that we are trying to finish, Joe, in about 45 minutes, yeah. it would perhaps be better to go down the question route. And, uh, and I think um, hopefully everybody has had a chance to read the papers. So I, that probably is the best way of doing it. So are there any questions? Uh, David. Yes, thank you, Jeff. Um, on page 54, 2.2.5, <coughs> second line from the bottom, um, talking about getting the viewer scheme members on various things, including the investment. How on earth would we do that? This is where I'm hoping Paul is in tune, it's his area. Um, <laughs> well, obviously we have um, you guys as um, scheme member representatives on the local pension board. And as you'll know, you've been invited to the 15th of July um, Responsible Investment Training Day, Information Day that Paul's running, um, where you will be surveyed as to your views on responsible investment. Um, <coughs> again, some consultations run publicly, are completely open for anybody to respond to if they've got an interest in the area. So. There's that. Paul, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, 15th of July, um, as you know, we do these information days where we get uh, both pension committees and local boards together from Northamptonshire and Cambridgeshire. Um, and this theme is about responsible investment. Now, it, it's quite important because this is going to feed through to the Access Asset Board as well. So we, you'll have a morning where the advisor will do a training session on responsible investment. Um, we'll have an expert from that company on responsible investment factors. So it should be quite revealing uh, as to the fund's activity and risks in this area. Following which we will send out an investment belief survey to all members of pension committee and local pension board. Now we're looking at a very tight turnaround on that because we think we, we obviously following the training we'd like you to complete the survey send it back as quickly as possible um, we may only give you a week to do that and that's because we want that information back as quickly as possible so that we can actually get it back into formulate the funds uh, responsible investment policy um, the afternoon of that session will be three different practitioners one who provides a Fossil, new, fossil fuel neutral index, uh, which we feel that you'd be interested in. It's something that we've been tracking for 18 months. We believe that um, it's it's got something of interest for the two funds to consider. Um, there will be a, a manager who will be uh, representing all our active managers on how managers engage on responsible investment factors, because clearly um, members, officers, uh, 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 local board members, uh, we're not close to these topics. The, the, the fund managers have the resources, they have the responsibility, they have the incentive, they have the passion for making sure that they engage with companies and only um, buy stock on our behalf that's going to earn us good return and has a good responsible investment cat uh, categories. You know, it's sustainable. So you're going to hear, hear from one of those. And then finally, we have um, a top investor who's been doing a lot of work on impact investing, both public and private sector. Uh, and, and that lady will be presenting a piece of work that she's done at a very high level. Uh, well, high, you know, it's been a well-recognized and well-respected um, piece of work and she'll be presented on that and, and showing you what we can do from impact investing. So it's a very important day. From that, the belief survey will feed into a report for September for the Pensions Committee uh, and Board to consider on what the, what the fund's responsible investment policy should look like. That will then feed down to Access because all of Access partners are undertaking this type of review and that will feel feedback through to the Access review access poll and it will inform the polling policy on responsible investment. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Paul. <clears throat> uh, does that answer your question, uh, David? I think so. I'm not quite sure, Simon, but we'll leave it there. Thanks. Right. And and are you able to attend in July? Uh, yes, I should be able to. I take it would be a Zoom meeting, will it? It. Yes, it will uh, I'm sure it will. Yes, it will be I'm Zoom sure, meeting sure it will. by Mercer's, um, and we have tried and tested this system, so it, it has worked very well in the past. Okay, Excellent. Sir. Thanks, Paul. And I've got, uh, and, and I've got a question from Barry. Um, I'm probably going to repeat the same thing, um, but I'm looking at a different part of the papers. So Appendix 2. Um, Yep. The Supreme Court decision on LG Well, just in the conclusion, I've highlighted that members' views um, should be effectively communicated to and considered by administrative authorities, presumably on investments. Um, other than what you said about surveying member representative, I, I, I feel that I can't speak for all scheme members. And surely there isn't there a need to actually have some sort of membership wide survey? Good question. Um, Paul yeah, Barrier again. Yeah. <laughs> um, bearing in mind, there's probably about uh, how many scheme members? Um, many thousand scheme members. Um, yeah. I'm not sure how we could easily do that, um, but maybe that's something we can think about from a communications angle. Paul, um, perhaps utilising the website, if that, that's an idea, if, if, you know, if that fits especially, in with your plan. Especially if you're going over towards the electronic communications, it should be easier. Yeah, I think it's, it's the timeliness and the need to act, act fast is perhaps the issue, but um, that's certainly something um, to consider, perhaps maybe worthy of mention on the 15th of July as well. Yeah. Um, whether it certainly, I'd ask that question on the fifteenth, Barry. I mean, we I can take it back anyway, but you might wish to to, to ask that question on the fifteenth as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is it is something that's been considered, um, and it is a very difficult issue because to survey every member uh, would uh, and actually have some integrity in the process um, is a very big ask and a, quite a costly ask. Um, we do have member representatives, we do have union representatives, um, so we, we try to, within reasonable parameters, engage with members through that, that, those forums. But of course we recognise there are limitations. I, I just brought it up because I've literally had a, uh, someone approach me this week on that very topic and I find it quite hard to answer that um, to do with um, disengagement <laughs> and things like that bear, bear in mind um, we we do how we do consult on the uh, the policy it will be published on the website and uh, we will encourage people to respond to that um, so uh, and of course we we do put in the information days we do get both of the funds together and both pension committees and local pension boards. So we get quite a broad group involved in that. We think that helps get a consensus, as, as wide a consensus of opinion over different um, stakeholders as we, as we practically can. Thank you, Paul. I do that the idea <clears throat> of trying to put something up on the website would be useful. Um, I know ev not everybody accesses the website or accesses it when they need to, but I think at least would then be trying to engage with people um, in, a, in a comprehensive way. So I think if we can do that, I would, I would strongly support that. Thank you. Um, just checking for hands. Uh, Dennis. I see you'd like to question. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, that debate was about consulting members. Do we ever consult employers on this? 
Uh, yes, um, employers, um, obviously they have employer representatives on the committee um, and employers are involved in, in, uh, in nominating that. We, are, we, we write to all employers and say, would you like to be your nominations? Uh, not a perfect process. Um, but of course, consultation wise, uh, when we publish on the website, um, uh, if employers are particularly motivated on a topic, they will respond. I must say, I would like to see that just a little bit more proactive. We don't have that number of employers and they're all on email. We certainly can use the um, employers team communications for that, absolutely. Uh, again, Paul, I have to say, I think that would be a very good idea. And the more we can um, canvas a wide variety of views, the better. So if, if you could take that down and take that as an action, I think, uh, presumably the rest of the board would support that, would they? Not hearing any dissent. <coughs> and I have no more hands. I, I just have a, uh, a, a couple. First one is on Appendix 3, uh, <coughs> where <coughs> it refers to uh, scans. Uh, has this actually gone out to all members? Um, no, it's going out to members who inquire about a transfer out. Um, it's been issued right. at this time by the three bodies involved because of concerns over the coronavirus, people perhaps in other types of pension schemes where the benefits are affected by investment performance. Uh, there was concern that people were going to act quickly um, and be persuaded by potential scammers to transfer their yes. benefits for potentially better return. Obviously, the LGPS is not affected by, uh, members' benefits aren't affected by um, periods of bad investment performance. So, um, but like I said earlier, there is a growing industry around scams um, and scammers take um, their opportunities when people are vulnerable, the virus situation being one of those. Um, and then of course, we're seeing the reverse of that where somebody has fallen victim to a scam and then wants to be reinstated back into our scheme at, at cost to us. Mm. So, um, and some cases have gone through the pensions ombudsman uh, and it has ruled that pension schemes have to reinstate them. And that, that is incredibly expensive when you've already paid out several, potentially several hundred thousand pounds because a member wanted to transfer out and then you have to reinstate them. That's 200,000 pounds, for example. So it's, it's a very concerning period of time. Um, scammers are incredibly smart and they'll always get smarter. Um, we're taking lots of extra precautions. Uh, if people, we get inquiries from companies, we send um, and they quote subject to access requests. We, we are obliged to fulfill their requests, but we tend to send the information back straight back to the member, just to make the whole process a bit more not difficult, but just to make sure the member's aware of what's going on, because some of the forms we receive from Companies are very unprofessional indeed. They've got signatures snipped into the documents. They're, they're very crudely created on Word and they are quite concerning. And a lot of them are based overseas, yet members still yeah. live in either Northamptonshire or Cambridge or this country. So it's a very tricky area now. Um, and that we've got to be really careful over. I and mean, certainly we've had a, a number of mis-selling complaints come in and um, Members also need to be careful of that as well because these companies aren't doing it for free. They're charging the likes of 20% for a successful reinstatement. So the member still has to pay, you know, yeah. get that company and they don't need to do that. I mean, if they feel that mis-selling is an issue, they can use the IDRP route, which is totally free. So um, it's a very complicated area now and something that from a governance perspective, we need to be completely on top of as best we can and then there's cyber crime that makes it all that a bit more difficult as well so yeah it's a very sensitive subject joe <clears throat> um the county council has been quite proactive in that we have uh set up um a uh a, a, a group of volunteers i'm one of them um anti-scam champions and would, would it be all right if I emailed you the detail, details of the person who's coordinating it? Because 
she communicates regularly with a wide group of people mm. and often a lot of those people tend to be older and i think that getting the, the circulated through that um you know through that means would could only be good yeah. so uh, um so if you're prepared to do that i'll circulate and then in future if there's anything that comes up about scams you'll have her contact details that you can include her in any emails so would that be okay that's lovely thank you thank you joe and the the, the final thing i just wanted to mention was on the uh, appendix four the online training events and um i've i've attended several of these recently i have to say i found them incredibly useful and i just wanted to make sure that uh, the various uh, their webinars that there are seven seminars really you you uh, you can take part in some of them but you don't have to um, but there's a lot of useful information there and i just wanted to confirm that the details of them are being circulated to all of the board members yes yeah when we hear of something we will circulate it um, i mean a lot of these organizations are switching from face to face meetings to Absolutely, yes. Yeah, but it's taking a bit longer for them to sort of get them ready, running with those. But yes, no, we will keep them, um, keep members updated, and, yes. and and also when things start to get back to normal, should they ever. <laughs> of uh, course, I, there may not be the appetite for people wanting to attend external events for a while. So, yeah, yeah. I, I would I would urge <clears throat> pension board members to take advantage of those because I I have found them very useful, and most of. The, well, the ones I've attended have only lasted an hour. They're not taking up a whole day. And uh, yeah, very good and very focused. And uh, be pleased to hear that uh, the July event is going going ahead. Looking forward to that very much. So um, we've got a question from Barry and also a question from Dennis. Barry. Um, yeah, it was just a comment on on your point, um, Councillor King, um, about the, the scammers. It was just an observation. Certainly, they are taking advantage of coronavirus. Yeah. Um, personally, in the early days of lockdown, um, where I live in St Ives, um, uh, they were doing the rounds, phoning people about their internet connections, etc. And I, I had, I literally had for about two days, I must have had about uh, 20 phone calls from the same scammer number. Well, what I'll do is I'll circulate uh, anti-scam coordinate information after. I would really urge you to pass that on. Um, and, uh, you know, um, it's the old saying, knowledge is power, so it can only be a good thing to do that. Thanks, yeah, Barry. I mean, I, mean, um, I, Dennis, I know. Sorry, sorry. I was just going to say. No, I, can't I, I just know personally, you can report it to the trading standards number, but that's part of my day job, so that's what I did. Yes, <laughs> that's that's good as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's, it, it, I don't think it's an either or. You can do both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, thanks, Barry. Um, Chairman, can I just say that um, I also have attended a number of um, those um, webinar events. Um, yeah. The um, local pension board one was most fascinating because we actually had breakout sessions during lunch and everybody was just chatting. It was quite bizarre at one level. Um, <laughs> But I think I also uh, attended a PLSA one um, uh, somewhat earlier. And I have to say that the it was really important to keep up with those because I, particularly with the last meeting being cancelled, I felt a, a disconnect from the terminology and everything else. So uh, I would totally back <coughs> recommendation that people should be going to them. Thank you very much, Dennis. Yes, I've found them very And uh, I'm not seeing any more hands. So um, 
we're being asked to note the contents of that report. And if you're happy to do that, we'll move on to agenda item nine, which uh, is also Joe. Yeah, I'm afraid it's all me. Um, okay, so the next report um, is the Pension Fund Annual Business Plan and Medium Term Strategy for the years 2019-20. That's not right. For the years 2021-22-23. 20, 20, um, yes. So... This report was actually, uh, the business plan itself should have gone in March to the Pensions Committee for approval. Uh, March meeting was cancelled, and so it went um, a couple of weeks ago to the June meeting and was approved by the committee there. Um, what I thought I'd do is just run a few, through a few points um, of this report. Um, firstly, it's been noted in 2.4, 2.5 and 2.6. Um, so when we first wrote this report back in February, March, um, it was all, it, we didn't think there'd be a problem and everything would you know, be running to plan. We had the coronavirus outbreak. So what we've done since then, ready for the presentation to the committee in, in June, was we re um, get some of the dates within the, within the report. So um, within the timelines of the activities. Also, I need to draw your attention to the cash flow projection section on page 10. Um, and it doesn't, just to say, it doesn't include any estimated impact resulting from the virus in any of the costings. Um, and also, I think I mentioned this to Councillor King in a separate email yesterday. Um, is, we are likely to see an overspend in staffing due to the fact that um, nobody has left during the period. Um, so normally we operate on a basis that there are always three vacancies. Currently we have none and no agency staff, so you're likely to see an overspend on staffing by the end of the year should things remain the same as they are now. So moving on to the important part of, the, of this, which is starts on page, sorry about this, page um, 92, which details the, the proposed activities for the year, which have now been agreed by um, Pension Committee and the associated costs. Um, I'll run through some of the really significant ones and happy to take questions on at the end as well. Um, so on page 92, the activity entitled SD4, which is extension of the existing pensions admin and payroll software. Um, our current contract um, came up for renewal during this year. Um, but what we've, de we've decided to do and the pension committee has agreed to do is take, it, um, take advantage of the extension period within the contract because going through this process to procure a new system or potentially a new system um, and for admin and payroll is, is quite a lengthy um, task, to, even with a framework involved. Um, not only that, we've got the reorganisation of Northamptonshire County Council and Verizon Districts, and what I'm going to talk about later is also the McLeod impact. Um, so we've decided to extend the running, um, existing contract for two more years, three more years, and um, we'll look to do a undertake a competitive procurement starting in April 2023. Um, we do expect that will take quite some time. We need to do that in a year in advance of having to renew the contract in, in 2024, no, 2023. So um, that's that item. Um, moving on to, um, sorry, just going through. Yes, on page 98, the activity entitled CSEM2, which is scope requirements for data collection in respect to the LGPS transitional protections. Um, this is probably something we need to widen up into a bigger activity now. Uh, this is the McLeod um, ruling and the amount of work we need to do to, once that legislation comes into force, which is not expected for a while yet, um, is the amount of work we need to do to collect data to make sure we can do the, the analysis properly and then also the amount of work required to make sure everyone's benefits have been looked at to make sure that the protections are in place um, and any the remedy has worked for them. Um, so you might see over time that this this one this particular activity expands into something much bigger um, as we go along. So that's going through. Um, I know Councillor King had a question and this is for Paul on the item number IN 
B4, page 103, 10 different independent investment advisors for fund. Um, Paul, um, Councillor King, did you want to read well, your question? Th thank you, Joe. I, uh, at a webinar, webinar I attended uh, um, the other day, um, there was mention made of an investment advisor uh, for Lancashire, Eric Lambert, who was very highly praised. Um, and he's produced some fantastic results uh, for Lancashire. And uh, if we could perhaps uh, suggest that we ought to consider um, procuring his services. Um, I, I'm not sure what the process is, but obviously, you know, whatever is, is, um, um, is in accord with the law. But certainly I would like us to at least talk to him about what he might be interested in doing for Cambridgeshire. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, an interesting question at an interesting time. Um, uh, yes, I mean, I, I was on the Scheme Advisory Board where uh, Lancashire, according to the Local Authority Universe, or as it was known, Local Authority Universe, has been the top fund for the last two years. Uh, they've been very fortunate, one could say. Um, and Eric is a, is a very well-known and, and respected advisor. Um, what I will say is at 12 o'clock today in 35 minutes, the <laughs> tender process that we have currently ongoing for an independent advisor comes to a conclusion. We uh, are expecting a goodly number of people to apply. Uh, whether Mr. Lambert is one of them is out of our control. Um, but if he does, he will be in the mix. Uh, I have to say, from the names we looked at on the proactive system, I did not spot his name. Um, but I can say um, that there, the names we have seen of interest are of high quality. And um, without, well, no, I, can't, I better not say it. Say it. Um, all I can say is they're of high quality. And at um, uh, one thirty today, I start scoring them. Well, <clears throat> and Paul, I'm sure you will do uh, a, 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 a conscientious and impartial job of doing that. And certainly, I wasn't trying in any way to, uh, you know, to jog your hand there. But uh, I, 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 like you, I was just very impressed with what they were saying about Eric. Yeah, what I can say is, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, you would recognise some of the names that we are seeing on the on the potential list. We don't know whether they will put a submission in, um, but um, we we have a process which will conclude in September. So um, uh, the the team will be evaluating the scores, uh, and everybody that meets the required standard will then move forward to interview. We expect there to be many interviews and the interviews will be the head of service, the chairman uh, of the pensions committee and uh, uh, the, the deputy 151. So um, I'm sure that they will do a good job once we've made sure that those that meet the required standard uh, go through for, for that last stage. Thank you, Paul. Um, and uh, Joe, did you want to conclude your uh, your patient? Um, yeah, that's all I really wanted to discuss, but happy to take any questions on any of the items in the report. Thank you, Joe. I have, uh, <clears throat> I have a hand from Councillor Payne, David Brooks and Barrison. So, uh, oh, no, uh, uh, from David and Barry. And, back, and Dennis is back now. So uh, shall we uh, take that first? Yes, David? You. Yes, thank oh. you. I have two questions. This may be a very strange one. On page 82, third paragraph about the administration of funds. Is this something that I've missed? Because I don't understand what this is. Right, yeah, this is something that's been evolving. Um, I think we may have alluded to it. Um, perhaps not very directly. LGSS is coming to an end very shortly. Um, and so what's happening is for the pension fund administration, Northamptonshire is going to be the lead 
it's going to be a, a lead authority model where Northamptonshire is a lead and effectively Cambridgeshire becomes a client on a, on a contract term. Okay, uh, sorry, I just don't recall it being discussed even. Well, it, it's not really a matter of for discussion or decision at pension committee or local pension board level. It, it's something that's evolved on the LGCS committee. Um, I don't know if Councillor King has any awareness of this from a Cambridge perspective. I know there was a certain reasons why LGSS came to an end. Um, I don't sure particularly my place to talk about that. Um, but this is the agreed way forward in terms of administration. Okay. Just, <clears throat> I, 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 I would just to to add very briefly to that. <clears throat> I think it was felt that we could do better than LGSX. I think in a nutshell, that's that's what has happened. And so we're looking at other ways of um, of delivering the service. OK, but, but people like Joe and Michelle and that will still be with us, I take it. Yes, yes. So um, effectively what we have, if this wasn't happening, Cambridge here would go back to being on its own and would have no staff, <laughs> which wouldn't be ideal, or would have to recruit a whole team of staff you know, of around about 40 at least. So this is the best way forward. Um, not sort of going into further more, more detail than, than Councillor King did, but this will be better costing wise for the Cambridgeshire Pension Fund as well. Thank you, thank you. And on page, if I make it, on page 89, um, under the investment uh, profit losses on disposal of assets, could someone just tell me what 209 million pounds refers to? Again, this is where I might need to get Paul in, <laughs> particularly on this one. Yes, I'm, I'm rapidly trying to find the page. Page um, 11, also 89. Just bear with me a second. It's on page 11, if you've got your page numbers. Um, so what, what's the, the number you're looking at, David? 100... 109 million pounds. Just yeah. Small, That's the net investments for 2021. On the 1920 forecast, you've got a loss of £209 million. Pounds. Oh, sorry, it's 209 Yeah, no, that makes yeah, sense. Um, oh, yeah, no, sorry, yes. It, 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 so I thought I, I misheard your number. Um, oh. That just reflects that as at the 31st of March, um, the fund uh, suffered a significant impact on investments. Um, it, markets fell the furthest they've fallen um, in history and they fell in 16 days. Unfortunately, it happened right on the end of the financial year. Um, what I can, so, so and what we reflect in there is of course that in the annual, annual accounts, we'll be reflecting <coughs> a significant uh, book, book value reduction in the value of the fund's assets. What I can say to you is that the fund has materially recovered that um, and if I, just have a second to open it up. Um, at the moment, as at the 26th of June, so um, the value of the fund on the 31st of March was 1.9 billion in terms of, of assets. No, sorry, sorry, three three billion. I'm looking at the wrong line, um, and we're now at 3.4 billion. So we've actually increased since March. We're basically back to the level we were in December, which was our highest level. So in December, the value of the fund's assets were 3.4 billion. They fell to approximately just over 3 billion as at the 31st of March. And as at the 26th of June, the because they're not audited figures, that the unaudited figures are 3.369 billion. So we're basically back to where we were. But that's just market movements. I like that. I wish I'd um, you'd been in the report as explaining what it was. It would have uh, saved me asking the question. Thank you. No, yes, yeah, so I appreciate that. Obviously, we're, we're, that report's at a moment in time. Thank you, Paul. Barry, would you like to ask your question? Not really a question. I think I spotted an error on page 99 or page 21. 
um, on the C E C S E M three parental evaluation. Um, it's got dates here, so it, it, it talks about the next valuation due 31st March 2022, but then it says fund results to be issued in summer of 2020. Presumably that's supposed to be 2022. Yeah. <laughs> Unless Thank someone's you. got a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're quite right. Well, 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 well spotted, Barry. And... Uh, Dennis. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I started by looking at the key challenges listed on page 88. Um, and then the a decision which feels absolutely right to uh, extend the number of uh, contracts rather than uh, go through a re-procurement process now and just wondering um, if one is looking at a plan over two, three, four years, um, whether there are adequate resources to meet all those key challenges, the deferred procurements and everything else. Okay, um, that's a very good question, particularly in light of McLeod. Um, We've had some analysis done by the fund's governance consultants with um, looking at the amount of cases that would potentially be affected by the remedy. Um, and as a service as a whole, so including Northamptonshire, they, they've predicted that we could need an additional 21 members of staff to deal with the remedy from a cloud. And that's not ever so clear in terms of how much we can rely on our admin system um, automating some of that work. But from what I know about the admin system, I can't believe for one moment it will be able to automate everything. Um, we've already had issues with the admin system not being able to um, identify which, which members would be in scope of the, um, the um, remedy. So there's a lot of work to be done by admin people, uh, software people to make sure that that's, that can be done. And but that is a, a national initiative that's been worked on centrally. Um, yes, there's a lot of work. Um, the procurements are, can be very, very lengthy and resource heavy. Um, obviously that's one of the reasons we've extended the admin and payroll software contract um, re-procurement re that because that would probably be our biggest resource drain, particularly if we the result of the procurement was that we had to go to a new supplier. Um, I can't actually, that would take at least a year of work to successfully migrate the data from one system to another. Um, I think we feel like we do have the right amount of staff. Um, the virus has, has not knocked us too much off course um, with things. Um, again, probably a question for Mark rather than for me. Um, as it stands, I think we're going to be okay. Paul, do you, would you concur with that? Um. Yes, I mean, I mean, it, as an interesting example, the uh, independent advisor was due to finish in May. Uh, obviously, we had to rethink how we how we delivered that. That will be delivered five months later than we originally planned. But a lot of that was because we had to uh, actually spend some time thinking about how we were going to do it, what what the future held. Now, I think we've got a better vision of what that future holds. We're now using Zoom, we've been comfortable with new ways of working. So I am fairly confident that whilst there will be some slippage, we will be able to cope with the new way of working. But there will be an impact, it will be slightly slower. Um, yeah, and it, it will take slightly longer. But yeah, we will, we, I'm confident we can deliver it. But when we have an issue, we will come to you and let you know. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> and uh, I don't have any other hands. So um, we are being asked to uh, note the, uh, the business plan and the medium term strategy. And if everybody's happy to do that, I think uh, we'll move on to agenda item 10. And is you again. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, 
work? Yes, so this report, we've probably discussed most of the content of this already, um, but this was written as a reassurance piece of work um, to provide you as a board with some confidence that we're, the LGSS administration is um, carrying on and we haven't really, um, that we've put in place all what we need to do to work from home um, and that business is carrying on as normal, bearing in mind that you know, the virus presented itself at rather short notice in terms of adapting to working from home. Uh, we always had a business continuity plan in place, but we didn't necessarily expect to be presented with a virus situation, more like a, a building being out of action or a technology failure. So um, I think in summary, looking back where we were three months ago, we've coped fantastically well. Um, key performance indicators demonstrate that the work is continuing as was. Um, what I have done here is created a, there's a, a specific risk log as opposed to cluttering up the main risk register with um, sort of low level risks as such, because we worked hard to get the risk register to a sort of suitable level of risks and sort of piling loads more in that could just go away in a few months, didn't seem sensible. Um, so with regards to the risk register, we just did add one further control in, and that was on risk number two, which is on page 115 of the report pack. Um, so we just, where it risk is failure to respond to changes in economic conditions, we just made a note in the controls that during the pandemic, there's been increased engagement with investment managers and monitoring of asset movements. Um, the risk log, um, again, as I said, contains some of the lower level, more operational risks. Um, again, this was written right at the beginning, and we've not had to worry about sort of these risks really presenting themselves as such. So, just a piece of assurance work, really, that we, we did consider these things what, as soon as they happened, and we produced this to demonstrate awareness of the risks. So, have to take any questions on any of that? I'm not seeing any hands raised. There are now. So, uh, sorry? Three. Oh, yes, there are. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it, it took a little while to register. So, uh, Councillor Machini. Oh, thank you. I was, before I go in a couple of minutes, I, uh, I was very, yes. I'm very happy that I'm here for this item because I was, um, I was very happy with it the previous time. And um, I mean, it's great and it's really nice to have that reassurance. And I was just going to uh, say thank you and hope that we'll go and we're going to see it in different guises going forward, this report as yeah. the landscape changes, but it's very good. It's very good that you've done that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor. And uh, as you have to go in it, so uh, we'll understand when you need to leave, so. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for accommodating me as well. I really appreciate it. It's, you know, it's been a short term emergency, but, you know, um, hopefully not repeated. Thank you. It, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure, sir. And, uh, and I think if it's not too uh, impertinent, I should just congratulate you on your election as leader of the Labour Group. So, uh, um, so well done. <laughs> thank you very and much. Could Barry, your hand is up as well. Uh, uh, it was um, pretty much the same as Councillor Machini. It was just to um, basically thank Extra Works uh, uh, on assuring us about the uh, pandemic and the effects on the fund. So just a thank you from me. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And I also have uh, Councillor Payne, Dennis. Thank you, Chairman. Um I had some questions on the uh, Appendix 2, the um, specific risk log there. And I suppose I was particularly concerned about data security and home working. Um, I'm assuming that, um, I believe that when we had the training on uh, this, a, a, what seems like a fair number of meetings ago. <laughs> um, there were some issues that uh, things like virus updates only got delivered when you connected to the central network in the offices. And I, 
assume that sort of thing has been changed so that um, uh, virus updates are going to everybody's machines um, uh, remotely. Um, but given that people will now be working via their home router um, and you have no idea how that is set up, uh, whether it, what type of password control or anything else is on it. Um, I'm just a little concerned mm -hmm. as to whether some of the uh, likelihood issues there are um, perhaps a little just optimistic. Um, that's all, that uh, was my uh, primary question and pr primary concern. Joe, would you like to say anything about that? Um, yes. Uh, okay. I'm not a by any means an IT or a data security expert, so my knowledge is based on what the County Council tell us is appropriate to do. Um, so the system that we all use is through a remote secure network. Um, so I don't necessarily personally understand the risks of routers being exposed to to the data, but effectively. We seem to be accessing the system in the same way as we did when we were in the office through a remote network, albeit through our own Wi-Fi systems. Um, there may be some risks there that I'm not aware of, but I will I will ask the question. Um, what was I going to say? Um, with regards to updates, and this might not be the news councillor Payne would like to hear, but this, it is still the case that, as far as I'm aware, that your laptops your NCC laptops only get virus updates if you take them into the building and because it, it picks it up from the Wi-Fi there. I went in a few weeks ago and did that. Um, so that may become an issue for IT as this progresses. So I think the usual recommendation was about every three months. <clears throat> they may have to review that with something else, but then not everybody is using an NCC laptop. Um, only, I mean, the one I'm currently using for this meeting isn't an NCC laptop. Um, so, yeah, there are, are but the council wouldn't issue everybody with a laptop. So, these are the risks that North Hampshire County Council have taken that we probably don't have a lot of control over. Joe, yeah, if, if I might just add to that, um, the obviously we we work under the Northamptonshire IT um, regime, uh, and we do get regular guidance and instruction on what we should and shouldn't do. Um, they have not alerted us to any issues or concerns about the current processes we use. In fact, I think they've encouraged us to do so. Uh, and they are very risk adverse. So there are things that they really won't let us use. So um, I would say there's a degree of, co of comfort in um, the engagement we have through our IT controllers. Thank you for that, Paul. But uh... My antivirus updates um, possibly daily, certainly weekly. Uh, I am really quite concerned about a process that only uh, that uh, may only update your antivirus definitions every three months. Um, I'm possibly a little more risk averse than your IT people. Um, can't say I feel warm and comfortable, certainly on that antivirus situation. Yeah, I should probably just clarify that the updates might not necessarily just be virus updates. They could be network updates, things like that. So again, I'm not the, the expert on that to, to give you definitive comfort or anything like that. So I'll take your concerns away. Yeah. Um, but I, what I'm hopeful is, is that the remote network provides, is supposed to be for this very purpose. So regardless of whether it's on someone's laptop or an NCC laptop, um, I would hope that IT has made the necessary adjustments and arrangements for it to be as secure as it possibly can. I don't see, thank you, Dennis. I don't see any other hands raised. So um, we are being asked to, uh, Note the contents of that report. And is everyone happy if we move on to agenda item 11, which is the last agenda item? And Michelle, that's you. Uh, yeah, not really much to say on this. Obviously the version um, that's been distributed um, is based on January. 
the pure fact that obviously we've had a busy couple of months with trying to um, look at other work and more pressing matters. So really what we'll do is send a revised version round once we've had a really good think about the business as usual activities plus any activities from the business plan and we'll get that circulated to you ahead of the next meeting. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, does anyone have or comments or suggestions? <clears throat> um, you'll make sure that the <clears throat> the standing items we agreed recruitment terms of reference, Michelle. In future, will you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And <clears throat> if there are no other questions or the meeting to say two very quick things well one very quick thing really the first is to thank all of the officers and uh, my fellow board members it was a very good meeting this was our first zoom meeting and it's actually the first zoom meeting i've chaired so i i i was in un uncharted territory so thank you all very much for your participation and uh, for asking some really good questions. And uh, thank you for the support from officers. And I, I, I want to single out, and I'll embarrass her now, Jo, who very kindly got some hard copies out to us. And they were a huge help, Jo. So thank you again for doing that. And uh, finally, I wanted to thank David uh, for your sterling job as vice chairman number of years and uh and and i'm sorry that you're stepping down from the board at the end of this year david but thank you for all all, all of your contributions so thank you all very much indeed and uh that concludes our meeting. thank you oh well, councillor Council king can i just ask um say something quickly of course joe so I just want to remind the committee members not only do you have the 15th of July um, Response and Investment Day um, that you're invited to attend, but also on the 23rd of July is what we call our annual meeting um, that members of the local pension board are, should have been invited to and are most welcome to attend. Um, if you haven't had details of that, let me know. Um, and if anybody wants hard copy papers for that, send me an email. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, just make sure that if you want to attend that, that please let us know that you are also invited. And but also it will be live streamed on YouTube. So if you don't get time to do it during the day, you know you can watch it later as well. So thank you, Chair. That's very helpful. So I, I wonder, Rob, could you send a reminder to, to us all about that uh, meeting at the end of July? Rob. Uh, I could, but it's probably better for the pensions officers to give me the okay. information than I will do. Yeah, yeah, because I don't. But one thing, I, the details. Well, you know, that's fine. So perhaps if 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 Joe would send us, and the other thing I was going to ask you uh, was about the meetings of the pension committee. We are entitled to attend those, and and of course with Zoom it's quite. Easy. So I wondered if we make sure that. Uh, the pension board are sent invitations to join the meeting. Okay. Yes, I, that would be on uh, an attendance basis. Yeah. Of course. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll uh, ensure that happens. Yeah. And presumably, uh, the uh, the pool, um, their meeting by Zoom, I guess. But we're we're not able to attend those. Well, I am, but I don't think anybody else is, are they? Um, there is a public, it is the 17th of July. Uh, there will be, I believe, a public section and then a private section. So anybody is invited to the public section, indeed. Um, okay. If people are interested, if they would uh, email me and uh, I'll make sure that they get the details. Right, that's the next pool meeting. I, that's very helpful, Paul, thank you. And, uh, and, and please, uh, Please do email Paul um, uh, for the details if you would like to attend the meeting. I know there has been some interest in the past as well. So um, thank you very much again to yeah, everybody for that. Ask, and, yeah. and sorry, I, David. Yeah, sorry, David, just, yes. Yeah, add my thanks uh, to Joe as well for all the stuff she's done, and especially for even allowing me to attend this meeting. 
and all the work she's done getting me the camera and everything. And can I just ask you whether that's a picture behind you or whether you're sitting somewhere very nice? Is that Joe? No, that's no, you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a picture behind well, you? Are you asking... Somewhere in the garden. With it. It's lovely no, and sunny. No, oh. no. Actually, <laughs> David, what I, I, that's a picture of part of my garden and uh, I use that as a backdrop. So, uh, but yes, uh, it, uh, so, so that is my own creation. <laughs> so nobody else to blame but me. But thank you all very much again. And uh, I, I hope you have a, enjoy the rest of the day and have a good weekend. Goodbye.